Production support for this episode of In Focus is provided by Hoosier Energy, providing electricity to Central and Southern Indiana electric cooperatives and their member customers. Information at HEPN.com. And by WTIU members. Thank you. Since the shooting last December at an elementary school in Newtown, Connecticut, school safety has been top of mind for legislators, administrators, and parents. But many disagree on just how safe schools are and how far school districts should go to prevent violence. We'll consider what the state and school districts are doing to improve safety on this episode of In Focus. And we want to thank you for joining us on this edition of In Focus. I'm Kyle Stokes, education reporter for State Impact Indiana. State lawmakers are considering a bill that would provide school districts up to $50,000 each to improve safety and add law enforcement officers called school resource officers. But as WTIU's Gretchen Frazee reports, some districts have not been waiting on the legislature to put new policies in place. Every school in Indiana is required to have a school security specialist to help with emergency management and safety issues. They must also receive training each year to keep up to date with the most recent advice on school security. School safety is a big umbrella. I mean, it is keeping someone who has uh, violent intentions out of your school. But we also need to remember we lost a school to a tornado event just over a year ago. So we need to talk about severe weather. We talk about safety at extracurricular events you know, the big, broad range of things that people need to be looking for in their schools. High-profile cases like the Sandy Hook Elementary shooting have led to the perception that schools have become more dangerous in recent years. In reality, incidences of school violence have been cut to a fourth of what they were in 1993, according to the National Center for Education Statistics. And state officials say they hope to cut that number down even further. The Indiana Attorney General's office began work last year on a proposal to add more law enforcement officials in schools. That proposal turned into a bill that made its way through the legislature this year, taking several forms. At one point, the bill would have required every school to employ armed personnel. The current version provides funding for schools that want to upgrade their security and encourages hiring school resource officers, law enforcement officials that are specifically trained to work in school settings. You can immediately see results where uh, the drugs get out of the schools, uh, weapons, uh, some of the bullying issues that are really, you know, pretty hard these days on kids. Some of those things get addressed. So the, the kids in school, the students, start to work with the law enforcement and really help police the inside of the school. Lieutenant Eric Crittenden worked as a school resource officer for 14 years before becoming the Indiana School Resource Officers Association president. He says resource officers can be a great asset to schools because they not only provide extra protection, but they also help students learn. To act as a, a counselor, mentor, mediator, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, to help uh, get the kids put them in the right direction that they may need uh, help with. Some schools have not waited for the legislature to increase security. The Vigo County School Corporation added 10 officers to its rural schools this year, and last summer Monroe County Community School Corporation added a buzz and door system. MCCSC Director of Planning John Carter says he would like to add school resource officers as well, but they're expensive. He says the $50,000 the state legislature is offering simply won't go very far, and there are still a lot of unanswered questions. Uh, uh, school resource officers are great. If we, can, as long as we don't have to take a teacher out of a classroom to have a school resource officer. We don't have resource officers anywhere. We have some security at the high schools, and that's it. Um, if we're adding resource officers, you know, I don't even know what a good fit is. Is it one per school? So there's 20 more staff members. The bill's proponents say they realize the financial support is small, but they hope to eventually build additional support for the program. And the attorney general says he will be meeting with individual school administrators in the coming months to help educate them on the best way to improve security in their schools. And we should mention as we tape this show, it's Thursday afternoon, April 25th. The General Assembly is still considering the bill. We don't know if it passed and in what form, but lawmakers tell us they are optimistic school safety legislation will pass. But to discuss school safety, we're joined in the studio tonight by Vigo County's Deputy Sheriff Clark Cottom, by Russ Skiba, a professor at the Center for Evaluation and Education Policy at Indiana University, and by Indiana State Teachers Association President Nate Schnellenberger. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you. 
We want to start off here with, with a few more statistics. We mentioned that the violent instances of crime in schools have gone down according to federal statistics, but there are other numbers we want to show you here. Let's put those up on the screen. Uh, in 1993, uh, there were in total incidences of crime in schools have gone down from 147 per 1,000 students to down to 32 per 1,000 students in more recent years. I'm wondering if I can throw it to you, panel, what that trend says to you. What should we make of those numbers, uh, Chief Cottam? Well, you know, basically there have been efforts. To, and it kind of started in our area back to Columbine. I was working the day that the Columbine shooting occurred, and, and it was a very tense situation. And we looked, we went back and reviewed that particular case and, and tried to figure out ways that we could perhaps prevent it from occurring in our schools. Uh, and also how to better deal with those things. So we went through a lot of training and, and put a lot of officers in, in different uh, scenarios and, and uh, in the schools training uh, with uh, the staff. And we've really increased uh, officer presence and officer training and also staff training as well. Dr. Skiba, I'm wondering because Columbine comes up, we've had Sandy Hook is fresh in our memories, and, and even the Boston bombings ha have sort of made it as, made us feel a little bit less safe. Mm -hmm. I, I'm wondering to what degree is that more than just a feeling of unease? Is, is there a reason that we should be ramping up security in, in our schools to respond to these events? Yeah, well, uh, um, it, it's really comp any, anything. We talk about it, it is really complicated because your statistic, the, the 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 single incidents you're citing, have uh, have seemed to in, increase in frequency, and that makes us feel more safe. While our general statistics seem to show that that our the the safety of our schools uh, is improving, I think um, we have in this in this uh, media age uh, all of a sudden things that once 30 or 40 years ago might have seemed removed to us. We are all there present when Sandy Hook happens and it might as well have been the school down the street to us because it has that has that visceral uh, impact and and it's it, it's what it does is it sends a clear message to us that we need to do all that we can to keep our kids safe in schools and yet at the same time I think it's important to to focus on those long-term statistics, to keep a cool head and say, well, you know, in general, though, our schools have been pretty safe. We have to keep working at this and addressing all aspects of the problem, but it's not a panic situation. We have time to take some time and studies and figure out what works best. We'll hold that thought on panic situation, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. I wanted, uh, Mr. <clears throat> Schellenberger, if you could react to something that I heard in the package and that I think that our, our, list, our viewers would, would probably want to hear about as well, and that's that uh, the, the person from Monroe County Schools who said, we don't have school resource officers in schools. What do you think's going on there? I, I mean, in this day and age, it seems like everybody should have something more than just a security guard or a, or a buzz-in system, given the media narrative these days, certainly. Well, I think it's, it's pretty simple, and, and anyone involved in, uh, in public education knows what's happened the last, uh, really, the last four years, and that school budgets have been extremely uh, decreased uh, because of, of state funding, uh, cuts in state funding. And it's, it's caused, a, 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 as a result, it's caused a, the number of teachers to be decreased, which uh, causes a, the, kid, the class sizes to be large and causes the loss of programs. So what he was referencing was just a budgetary uh, situation where they simply don't have money to put resource officers into school. I think uh, any schools that have school resource officers understand that they're valuable and that they're helpful to the, uh, to the whole process, in, in not, not only in uh, school safety, but more so in, in educating students and, and, and maybe the drugs and, and those types of things. But uh, the, what he was saying was, look, we don't have enough money to have the staff that we need to have right now, the teaching staff. And so let's not sacrifice more teaching staff, make class sizes even larger, take away more opportunities for students to learn at the expense of putting a resource officer there. So what, and really what we as a, a state organization, the, the, the Indiana State Teacher Association, don't want to see is a legislature to pass an unfunded mandate that everybody must have these, but, but we're going to give you $50,000, even though we know that it's going to cost you uh, many, many times that amount of money.
Is that what we have right now in the legislature? Dr. Skiba, maybe you can jump in there. You, you look well, like you had a comment. Yeah, I, 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 I want to uh, agree with Mr. Schnellenberger. Uh, you know, um, I, I had the privilege to hear uh, uh, Chief Daryl Stevens, who's the executive director of the major cities um, chief, uh, chief of police. Uh, and um, one of the clear points he makes uh, is that he doesn't believe that uh, police presence or even school resource officer presence is necessary in every single school. Uh, I think he rightly points out that, that school safety and security is a complicated issue and what will work in a school in IPS may not be the best thing for a school in Monroe County uh, or a school in, in Terre Haute. There are local conditions that make it really important for uh, for, for, for a local planning team to say what are, what are our needs here and what aspects do we best need to guard against the threats that we face in our local community. Chief Cottom, do you think that there is, there is room for the legislature to say, we'll, we'll make this grant available, but, but, but this is something that we really need you to do. This is something that is more than just something that we can provide as elective funding. We really need you to, to step up to the mark here. Well, we have to have uh, local control and, and management uh, at our local level through our local sheriffs. <coughs> Vigo County is fortunate. Uh, we have 23 schools total in the county, and we currently have an officer uh, at, in all 23 schools. But Vigo County was in a situation where the school uh, corporation and also the county council were able to fund that project. A neighboring county just to the south, I talked to Sheriff Brian Kennett at the uh, Sullivan County Sheriff Department just two weeks ago on this very matter. Uh, his department is a nine-man department. He has ten schools in his county. Uh, if this were mandated, uh, Sheriff Kennett would li literally be doubling the size of his sheriff department. That is quite an undertaking. And here's what else we have to keep in mind. <clears throat> arming teachers or arming a custodian or, or just arming some citizen who would volunteer out of the, out of the community to come and stand guard at, at, at the school, it is a lot more complicated than that. Uh, we strongly believe that it needs to be an academy trained law enforcement officer with um, years mm -hmm. of experience uh, for that matter uh, capable of dealing with all the very complex issues uh, of school security and, and also uh, search and seizure and Miranda and arrest and, and all the other, uh, you know, varied aspects. Uh, it's a lot more than handgun training uh, to put an officer in the schools. And, and, and as Sheriff Kennett uh, explained to me in Sullivan County, how can he double the size of his of his department with fifty thousand dollars? It can't happen. Mm -hmm. Chief Cotton brings up what is one of the many elephants in the room here. Uh, not just the I, the issue of panic and the idea of of you know the the the, the fears about school safety, but also uh, the potential amendment that was introduced for the bill that would have uh, made it required for all schools to have an armed staff member, not necessarily a police officer or, or someone with just basically handgun training. It, it occurs to me, and I wonder, Chief Cottom, if you can confirm my suspicion that the issue there is is not so much about having someone with a gun that knows how to shoot, but know when not to shoot. Might exactly. The there is a tremendous amount of liability. When we hire a new deputy sheriff in Vigo County, it is a year worth of training before that officer is ever released to the road. And that includes the Indiana Law Enforcement Academy, which is a three-month program uh, five days a week off campus. So we're talking about an extensive, extensive amount of training and plus continuing education. You can't just hire a citizen off the street and, and hand him a gun and put him uh, there to guard a school. It, it will not work and it could, in, in many cases, create more liability, more injury, and more loss of life. I see both of you down on the other end of the table kind of nodding along mm -hmm. here. And, and just to play devil's advocate, is there not some use for, for some of the most cataclysmic instances of school violence where someone with a gun could have helped? Uh, and, and given the, the thought that this can happen anywhere, isn't then the mandate to have a gun in the school, does that not then have some use? Well, let me comment on that. Uh, when, we, when we talk about... Uh, the, the tremendous, th terrible things that have happened, like in Columbine and in you know in the East Coast recently, uh, those are the, the individual that came in was armed uh, to the to the teeth. So one person with a handgun, it's like you know the old saying, you don't you want to go to you don't want to go to a gunfight with a knife. So we got to get to a point then where we're going to say, well, who's going to have uh, this arsenal of ammunition 
because whoever come, you know, the guy who came into Columbine was loaded to, 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 to do damage, and, and so was the thing in, uh, on the East Coast. So uh, giving a, t a teacher a handgun or even an officer uh, a handgun, uh, I, I, I can't agree with, uh, with the officer here more that that's, that's, that's not necessarily the way to do that. Uh, from, a, from our standpoint, we just think that the proliferation of, of guns in school is never a good idea. Um, even even at, at home when we have parents who are used to guns and, and handle guns, we occasionally f hear about a child who gets into a, the gun cabinet and, and ends up shooting themselves or hurting themselves. So there's just a myriad of questions that in, in the school setting, if they were going to give a gun to a teacher, uh, the training couldn't be enough. Uh, we didn't, you know, as educators, we didn't go in that profession. Uh, we didn't go into the profession of handling guns. We went to the profession of, of educating kids. And who's going to take care of the kids if, if, if I have to go out to, into the hallway with a handgun and somebody's out there with an assault rifle? Uh, and so we, we just think there's, that's something that hasn't been thought through. Thank goodness, I will give the legislature uh, credit, thank goodness cooler heads prevailed and mm -hmm. they took that out. And I think they did because they heard from groups like ours and groups like yours mm -hmm. that said, no, this is just a really bad idea. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Skiba, I, I want to pick it up here because it, it seems like that's one of the, like I mentioned, it's an elephant in the room. It's something that has definitely taken over the narrative mm -hmm. uh, about this piece of legislation. The other thing has been Sandy Hook because the, the, the Attorney General uh, said that this was legislation that was in the works prior to the school shootings mm -hmm. in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And so I want to return to your point about panic, that we mm -hmm. haven't reached a, a panic point yet. There's a school security consultant whose name is Ken Trump, and he, he, he is a widely heard and, and, and widely trafficked in, in the popular press. But, well paid. But he, he, <laughs> writes, he writes the following. He says, to think that our schools are immune from terrorism is called being in denial, will their next soft target be our, our schools? I, I think that that's something that definitely surrounds the, this legislation, is the idea that our schools are not safe. And no matter how many statistics you show at someone, th there, is, there is a visceral feeling that mm -hmm. they're just not safe. And this is more than just a, a, a tentative approach. We need to yeah. do something. Well, uh, that, that appeal to fear has been really prevalent in, in some approaches to school safety for the, for the last 30 years. Uh, uh, in you know, approaches in the, in the early 90s, like Joe Clark with, with a baseball bat, were predicated upon that notion that there were super predators out there who were preying on students and that our, our levels of school violence were increasing dramatically. We found out later on that that uh, super predators, they really, it was a myth, and, and that our, our schools had main, maintained um, a high level of safety. Um, there, there, if we respond uh, with emotional reactions, uh, there, there, there's two dangers. One is that we will put in place, we, we get this feeling that there isn't time to study the matter. And so we've got to put in whatever we think will work. Well, what happened with zero tolerance in the 1990s is that that, was, that prolif proliferated in schools across America. And now we know from reports by the American Psychological Association, the American Association of Pediatrics, that said actually zero tolerance is a risk factor for kids. We know now that those things were, were ill-considered. And we had to go for 10 or 15 years of poor policies that may have increased uh, exclusion from school, that may have increased dropout, that may have increased uh, 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 contact with the juvenile justice system uh, among kids. The other thing is that, you know, Sandy Hook was, uh, of all of the major incidents that we've seen of, of violence in our schools, all of the school shootings in the late 90s and, and early part of this century, that was the only one that was dealing with an external threat. And all of our other school shootings were really about a kid who came from the school, who, who most often was bullied. And so if we focus only on this current threat on Sandy Hook, as it's important for us to protect our schools against external threats to safety, but it's also important for us to look internally and say, what are the internal threats? Have we done all that we can about bullying prevention? Are we teaching our kids how to get along? Um, we, if we focus only on one event, it's, it's very complicated. We don't know that the next event won't be something entirely different, uh, and, and we will have put a lot of resources into that. So we have to be focusing on both external and internal threats. Mm -hmm. If I could, I would I, uh, agree 100 percent, and I think that most experts who study this agree that uh, it'd be, it's really important that we increase 
uh, spending in, uh, for mental health mm -hmm. studies for, and, and mental health help for our, not only our students who, who need that, but also for the general population. In, in this time of uh, the economy that we've had the last uh, several years, mental health services have been reduced when actually uh, increasing those services now would help as much with this type of problem probably as, as anything else. But it, you're exactly right, the, the, you know, with those, those attacks that we've had have come from inside the school. And I, and I should mention that Columbine had an armed officer on duty. Uh, it happened to be eating lunch at that time. And then that raises the question, even with armed officers, they can't be there 100% of the time. If we want to take it to the extreme uh, and say that, uh, you know, we're going we're to have to protect our schools against terrorist attacks, then we really need to build walls around our schools and make them like prisons. And I don't think that's something that communities really want to do. Chief Cottom, let's, let's move beyond the, the point about fear and talk a little bit more. Let's get down to brass tacks about this piece of legislation. You were in schools as a school resource officer yourself. Tell me a little bit about what you did and what you think this legislation is possibly what it aims to bring into Indiana schools. Well, certainly. Uh, it, it's, it's very similar comparison. It's, it's like putting a major fire out. But we also have to look and work on fire prevention, too, as well. And uh, when we talk about prevention uh, in the schools, we're talking about uh, working on a daily basis with the children in the schools. And I'm, we're talking about starting at kindergarten, uh, ha having programs in those classrooms in first grade, all the way up through elementary, through junior high school, into the high school levels, and establishing a rapport with kids and with students um, that, uh, that uh, law enforcement is, is a friend and, and they it's somebody that they can look up to. That, that creates a dialogue, a two-way dialogue with the student and the officer in the school and perhaps that officer can identify a particular problem and help a student um, uh, with a particular problem before it, it gets out of hand or be, before it comes, becomes a, col a Columbine or a, or a Sandy Hook. When you say rapport, it sort of suggests that you want to make it clear to a student that the police officer or the, or the sheriff's deputy or whoever is on their side as opposed to opposed to them. In a, in Absolutely, and in, in many cases, and, and certainly not all cases, but in many cases, um, individuals who end up becoming uh, uh, predators in this particular type of, of crime, uh, they come from, from a childhood uh, of, of, of abuse and, and of, of a troubled past and of a troubled life. And, and I have been in classrooms and taught classes and at the end of a 30 minute or 45 minute program, I've had students come up to me and say, uh, my parents were wrong. Well, you're not, you guys aren't bad guys. <laughs> Um, and uh, so it, it really has been very, very rewarding as a school education officer to teach in those classrooms and to put on summer camps and junior police academies and, and these kind of things to start a very, very positive relationship um, where, uh, where children think that law enforcement are, are their friends and we are there to help. After all, we are. But uh, sometimes children are brainwashed. Uh, it, it even goes back to a, a very young age. Um, you know, and, and I'll say this to your viewers as well. Uh, a lot of times we'll be in a restaurant uh, having uh, uh, dinner or lunch. Police officers do eat. And uh, <laughs> we are in a restaurant and um, there will be a child uh, across the way looking at us, admiring the, the uniform. And, and uh, a lot of children face it, would want to grow up someday to be a police officer, grow up someday to be a firefighter. And one of the things that you will hear a parent say occasionally is, see that officer over there, I'm gonna have him take you to jail, or I'm gonna have him get you. And you'll, you'll notice a little bit of fear come across the child's eyes. And that is a message that we do not wanna be sending to children, that the police are going to arrest them or get them for something as minor as standing up in the booth at a restaurant or, or uh, uh, perhaps you know, not cleaning up their room or, or some other minor infraction that, that uh, occurs in the home. I, I want to bring up, though, as sort of a counterpoint, I mean, I, I don't want to dispute that there is rapport that's set up. One of the perhaps unintended consequences, the New York Times did a story about this, this is what they wrote, is that one of the most striking impacts of putting school police officers in, or police officers into school so far, according to critics, has been uh, what the New York Times reports is a surge in arrests for misdemeanor charges for essentially nonviolent behavior, including scuffles and truancy and cursing at teachers. Is, is that an unintended consequence of, of going down this road? And, and is, it, is it a good idea? 
idea to focus so much on putting school, putting more police officers into schools when it's perhaps a, a problem that staffs themselves could solve. Well, what they're citing there, I would, I would say that that is a management and a hiring and a screening uh, problem. Uh, you don't put law enforcement officers, you don't hire law enforcement officers to begin with that are bullies, much less put them in school settings to, to exercise uh, that type of uh, attitude towards children. We are hiring people very, very uh, careful scrutiny and screening going into the officers that we're hiring. We're making sure that we are putting officers in the schools that in many cases are parents themselves, uh, officers that can relate to the children. That's all about officer placement and you've got to make sure that you are putting the right type individual and the right type personality in the right type setting. Whether we're talking about law enforcement or classrooms or any other kind of mm -hmm. walk of life, it, it, it certainly is officer placement and, and personalities and you have to have the right person there and there. So I think I would, I would think that's more of a management problem uh, to be honest with you is is uh, we haven't set our officers in there to go out there and, and arrest people and get people and those kind of things. Um, you know, <clears throat> Sandy Hook changed uh, the way we do business. Uh, it set a fear factor uh, and how long that fear will last, it'll probably last until the next Sandy Hook. But um, uh, we felt that students, uh, and, and they came up and told us, and parents and staff for that, for that matter, they didn't feel safe in the schools regardless of what the, the numbers show or the st statistics or even reality for mm -hmm. that matter. Mm -hmm. It was mm -hmm. uh, a feeling mm -hmm. of we're not safe, we're not comfortable. Mm -hmm. And uh, we responded by putting officers in the schools on a temporary basis and it, was, and it was well received and positive and we started seeing positive results out of this. And, and to date, we've had officers in the schools since Sandy Hook occurred, since the very next day. And to date, we've not made any arrests. It's mm -hmm. not about making arrests, mm -hmm. it's about mm -hmm. officer presence and providing a level of comfort so the teachers can get back to their business and the students can get back to their business. Dr. Skiba, we've, we've got about, a, about 30 seconds left here. Does, does that sound about right to you that it oh, is a absolutely. management issue? Absolutely. I, I think the, quest, the important question is not whether we put school resource officers in schools, but, but how we do it. How, how we pay attention to that. And, you know, NASRO, the National Association of School Resource Officers, has a wonderful triangle that has, you know, school resource officers there for, for mentoring, for education, and for law enforcement. And that balance, I think, is really critical. If we put uh, uh, our school resource officers in place to be integrated into a school safety plan, they can make a tremendous contribution. If, on the other hand, um, we just willy-nilly uh, put police in schools without any training, without any integration, it, it really increases the chance of those kind of arrests for misdemeanors that you talk about. So I it's really agree. a matter of, of how we do it. And yes. we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you all so much for being with us tonight. We really want to thank our panel of experts for joining us here on In Focus. And we want to remind you that at the time of this taping, again, the legislature is still considering this bill that would provide funding for school resource officers. And for the most up-to-date information, please go to indianapublicmedia.org slash news. You can also leave a comment or see the full video of this show by visiting our website, indianapublicmedia.org slash infocus. And thank you to all of you for watching and listening. Have a great night. Production support for this episode of In Focus is provided by Hoosier Energy, providing electricity to Central and Southern Indiana electric cooperatives and their member customers. Information at HEPN.com. And by WTIU members. Thank you.